Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this international release on the technical brief on school violence, why gender matters, and how to measure school-related gender-based violence. This webinar offers simultaneous interpretations in both English and French. To select your preferred audio language, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select either English or French. Thanks for joining us from all around the world. My name is Maria Nguyen from the SDG for Youth Network and from Family Planning Australia, and I'll be your moderator for today. In addition to my professional roles, I'm also a daughter, a sister, a friend. And as we come together online today to discuss about school violence, I encourage you to think also what roles you play in your own lives, both professionally and personally, and to reflect upon the various relationships that are important to you. Because as we look at some existing statistics and we discuss about how to measure school-related gender-based violence, we need to remember that what we're measuring is more than just a number sitting in a document. It's measuring real experiences, real traumas about real people. These are real stories that could have happened to any of us when we were in school or to the people we know. If we are to adequately address violence that occurs in school and around school, including in cyberspaces, we need to rec recognize there is a link between many instances of school-related violence with gender. Sometimes the link to gender is explicit such as female genital cutting, um, or for example, child early and forced marriages. Sometimes the role gender plays in shaping violence is implicit, such as with corporal punishment, which is experienced more by boys than girls. Often some forms of violence or bullying are normalized, such as when a girl is mocked or excluded for menstruating, or when a student is bullied for being perceived or being non-binary. We need to make visible these gender norms and power differences and how they play in any given event of violence to understand why it happened and what impact it may have on the people involved. And to make it visible, we need to be able to measure it. Today's webinar will explore exactly that. Why gender matters and how we can measure school-related gender-based violence. We will begin with opening remarks from Ms. Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education from UNESCO, and a short online quiz. We will then hear key messages and recommendations from the technical brief from Ms. Joanna Herat, Acting Chief of the Section for Health and Education from UNESCO before our thought-provoking panel discussion with Ms. Maya Cornelia Musa from Transform Education and Be With You Indonesia, Mr. Ian Rivers from the University of Strathclyde, and Ms. Stephanie Burrows from the World Health Organization. We will then examine country examples from Cote d'Ivoire with Ms. Bamba Boa Adjaratu and hear from Ms. Chrissy Hart from Together for Girls. And after a Q&A segment, Antara Ganguri, Director of Angai, will share some closing remarks. We kindly encourage you to post comments and questions related to the theme of our webinar through the event via the Q&A function at the bottom. We will aim to respond to your questions and address any comments either verbally or in writing. But please note that you will not be able to post any comments or questions via the chat function. However, the organizing team will provide you with important links and resources via this chat feature, so please keep an eye out for the chat. I would like to now introduce Ms. Stefania Giannini of UNESCO to share the opening remarks via video.
I'm delighted to open this webinar for the launch of the new technical brief on school violence, why gender matters, and how to measure school-related gender-based uh, violence. Well, school violence is a global phenomenon that deprives millions of children and young people of their fundamental right to education, health, and well-being. Like all forms of violence, gender norms and gender inequality are drivers of school violence, and we have so many examples, unfortunately, when girls are mocked by boys at school because they are menstruating, when boys are bullied by peers for displaying submissive behaviors, when sexual violence is perpetrated by peers or teachers against students. While we know that school-related gender-based violence occurs in every country around the world, the true scale and impact remains largely hidden. This contributes to a detrimental culture of silence, a silence which is reinforced by social and gender norms that stigmatize victims of school violence, a silence that leaves far too many learners vulnerable to the damaging consequences of school-related gender-based violence. And this silence must be broken. To break this silence, we need better data. We must strengthen the way school violence is measured and apply a gender lens. Only when we have strong dat data to better understand how gender norms and power imbalances contribute to school violence, only then we'll be able to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for all and actually achieve SDG 4. The new technical brief that you are launching today with the Global Working Group to End School-Related Gender-Based Violence, co-convened by UNESCO and UNGAY, offers a, a real guidance to strengthen data and keep gender at the heart of responses to school violence. This is key because to end this phenomenon, we must recognize this first. We must measure it and take coordinating action to ensure the right to education, health, and well-being of all children and young people in the world. And I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To further frame our understanding of school-related gender-based violence, we're also going to be doing a mentee quiz. So if you could please use a device um, to log on to mentee.com and at the top, you can see there is a code. So 64200768. As you log on to this website and use the code, you will see some questions here for our quiz. So here is the first question. Globally, what proportion of women aged 15 to 29 are subjected to intimate partner or non-partner violence during their lifetime? So the options are 21%, 31%, and 41%. Okay, so we can see live there the different responses that all the participants have. The answer to this one is 31%. So given the alarming high rates of violence against women in this data, it's likely that this is reflected as well in patterns of violence in school. Let's go on to the next question now. So here's the second question in the mentee. Globally, what proportion of students report that they have been bullied by their peers at least once in the last month? So you've got the options 12%, 22%, and 32%. 
Okay, so the correct answer to this one is 32%. So that's one in three students. And learners of different genders are vulnerable to different forms of violence. There are many other intersecting vulnerabilities that we need to remember and consider that also influence learners' experiences of violence in schools. Thank you so much for participating in that Menti quiz. I hope that kind of frames our discussion for today. I would like to now introduce Ms. Joanna Herrat, Acting Chief of Section, Section for Health and Education from UNESCO, to now do a, pre, uh, to do a presentation on technical brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, the Acting Chief of Section for Health and Education at UNESCO. Um, and in that role, I'm also the co-chair of the Global Working Group to end SRGBV jointly with UNGAI. And always a pleasure to collaborate with UNGAI in delivering um, briefs such as this and uh, this event today, this launch and discussion. I really appreciate the opening remarks that Maria um, and our Assistant Director General just made, and particularly the call to think about the lived experiences and what it is that we're talking about um, today as we think mostly about numbers and measurement. Next slide, please. So as we have just heard, there are a number of startling st statistics on the issue of violence. But there isn't one source that allows us to understand specifically the prevalence of school-related gender-based violence. So in order to address this gap in prevalence data, the Global Working Group on SRGBV established an expert working group back in 2021 in order to facilitate some guided discussions in depth on the different data sources and how we as a global community could unpack this specific question of how do we measure SRGBV? How do we measure violence that is gender-based using the data that we have available to us? Some of these experts are in the room and will be speaking today, um, and many I think may be in the audience. And the group included 18 people, a mixture of measurement specialists, as well as policy and program people, so that we can really ensure that any data that is being used and the indicators that are recommended are going to be useful for policy and programmers. So whilst the group attempted to establish a unified measurement framework for SRGBV, in fact, ultimately, the more important insights emerged around the opportunities and the limitations of the data and the extent to which it can be used to measure gender as a driving factor. Next slide, please. So today, we're very pleased to be launching the fruits of this work in a technical brief published by UNESCO and UNGAI that you can see here. And I think the link will be given in the chat very shortly. Next slide, please. So let me talk you through some of the main findings and the main debates presented in this brief. We all know that gender norms are contributing to violence in schools and that this issue is becoming increasingly recognized in national, regional and international debates. But as I mentioned, we don't have prevalence figure. So we know, as we just heard, that around one in three students report experiencing physical violence in or around school, similar prevalence rate for bullying and also psychological violence, according to some data. The global prevalence of sexual violence in schools has been more difficult to capture we believe because of the sensitivity of the topic, inconsistencies in the definition, and also the risks of disclosure. National data is also limited with few, if any, national education management information systems collecting data on gender-based violence. But as we just heard, global data shows that well, a different statistic, sorry, but a, a, an additional one. Global data shows that one in four young women has already experienced violence by an intimate partner, whether that be sexual or other forms of violence, by the time they're 24 years old. So there is violence happening. Young women are experiencing it. Young men are experiencing it in school, in communities. And all of this indicates to us the presence of gender-based violence, including sexual violence among school-aged children. But it's complicated to measure. Next slide, please. 
So the first thing to reflect on is what would we be measuring? So since 2016, there has been an internationally used definition of SRGDV and recommendations for how to implement effective responses. And you can see the definition here on your screen. It includes acts or threats. It references sexual, physical and psychological violence. And it talks about it being perpetrated as a result of gender norms and stereotypes enforced by unequal power dynamics. This is a complex definition and that's important for us to have complexity because that allows nuance when we're developing program and policy responses. But when we're talking about measurement, usually something simpler is more helpful. Next slide, please. So as we heard in the definition, and I just want to recall that there's many different types of violence that can generally be defined under three uh, types, physical, psychological, and sexual violence with some crossover. And you can see that the types of acts of violence might range from verbal abuse or corporal punishment or coercion or um, sexual comments and jokes. So gender, as we see in this image, may be an underlying driver, a cross-cutting theme across all of these different types of violence. So we had to ask ourselves the question, what tools already exist that can measure different forms of violence in schools and understand the gendered component of that? Next slide, please. The expert working group looked at a wide range of types of data and research and discussed the merits of global data sets as well as localized quantitative and qualitative data. When we look at the global data sets, the expert group identified these four major surveys as particularly useful, as they include questions about the experience of school violence. As you can see, they cover different age ranges and they cover different countries. So whilst there's a wealth of useful information within them, it makes it difficult to aggregate this information together into one reliable statistic. Next slide, please. So through the review of the existing data sets, it is clear that whilst these large scale surveys reflect a range of types of violence, they're broader than just gender-based violence. They also each contain a number of specific indicators which are highly relevant to the definition that I just shared of SRGDV. And when we look at the indicators in each set, we need to be asking the following questions to determine their relevance to SRGBV. The first is, does the indicator focus on events in and around school or with people related to school, school staff, for example? This parameter is quite easy to define and many indicators do include this in their definition. The second parameter is more complex. So in analyzing an indicator and the actions that it describes, such as physical fighting or bullying, the question begs to determine whether violence can be considered, considered to be driven by gender. As you can imagine, there's wide debates about the concept of gender and varying conceptual understandings of the extent to which gender may be a driving factor for violence that is occurring. But with this in mind, the expert group spent time debating and reaching consensus on which forms of violence and which circumstances of violence as currently measured through data sets, could reasonably be considered to be driven by gender. And so in the next slide, I'll show those indicators which were identified, which when we view them together or in part, they provide a useful approximation of SRGBV. Next slide, please. So these items from existing surveys, as I say, provide a useful approximation. They bring together different indicators on different forms of violence, and they exclude those that really cannot be considered to be primarily driven by gender norms. So these indicators can be seen as the starting point for understanding school violence with the added lens of gender. So first on the list is the topic of sexual violence, which everybody agreed immediately is definitely a form of gender-based violence, no question there. But the data that we have is from the Violence Against Children surveys, which is only in 21 countries. And this demonstrates a huge gap in global data collection. Physical violence, which you see further down the slide, is covered more widely through the GSHS, which is in 96 countries in Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America. 
And these are included in our summary of gender-based violence because of the influence of gender norms on boys, which relate to harmful masculinity, which may often be expressed, for example, through physical fighting. Next slide, please. The next subset is bullying. This is one of the most commonly used measures in international data sets, but the definition may be quite narrow and doesn't reflect the full range of violence that may be happening, nor what's driving the violence. Cyberbullying, another important form of violence, which we're seeing apparently more and more of, um, is only measured in the HBSC, which is in Europe and North America. Finally, psychological violence is also included in the large scale GSHS with these kinds of detailed questions, which can be very helpful. So these survey items are helpful points of data to triangulate with other sources and to stimulate further analysis and maybe even additional data collection. At national and local levels, the existing data sheds light on patterns of SRGBB, but also must be understood through the localized lens of gender inequalities and norms. When I reflect on these proposed indicators, I'm actually struck by the wide range of information available to us as policymakers, as researchers and programmers. And in fact, one of the main messages that I personally take from this work is there is a wealth of data in existence. It may not be perfect and it may not tell the whole story, but if we take the time to delve into it, we can begin to see and understand patterns of violence, patterns of behaviors and experiences that can immediately shine a light on where and how children might be most unsafe and how to create safer learning environments that protect children as well as teachers in those establishments. Next slide, please. So we have some indicators that we can use as reference, but there are gaps. So the black holes in our knowledge of what kind of violence is happening um, are largely around the um, circumstances of violence. So we need to make the indicators in the existing data sets a little bit clearer. So include location or other defining features. We also absolutely, as an international community, need to collect more data on sexual violence. This is woefully undersurveyed. We need to harmonize the parameters for data collection, such as age ranges and when the violence happens. Was it in the last month or in the last year? As you'll recall from a previous slide, the four major data sets have very different parameters. And finally, we cannot underscore um, enough the importance of qualitative studies to provide clearer explanations for what is happening and to add explanatory power to the quantitative data. Next slide, please. Overall, in the brief, Next slide, please. We make six recommendations for the measurement of any form of school violence. The first is to use a gender lens to collect, interpret, and employ data on school violence. As I mentioned, the second, there's a lot of data. Seek it out, see if it meets your needs, use it for your programming. Thirdly, we encourage coordination between actors. If you're going to do primary data collection, coordinate to reduce duplication and improve complementarity. We also recommend that questions about violence are integrated into national information systems and periodic surveys. We really urge for the inclusion and to add for many people to advocate for the inclusion of data that is commonly missed, notably sexual violence. And finally, qualitative data and localized research will help explain the why of school violence and thus build better prevention and response. So what can we conclude from all of this? It's necessary to apply a gender transformative lens that recognizes that gender norms and stereotypes are fueling school violence in order that harmful norms and power imbalances can be explicitly addressed in the school environment. It's also important to address current gaps in the evidence base, particularly related to school-related sexual violence, as well as more data on perpetrators, on bystanders, or the location of violence. As I mentioned, we have various sources of data that can be used, but we need more harmonization between data sources and the systematic inclusion of standardized indicators in national surveys. And my final conclusion, our final conclusion, 
is that we need to remember the ultimate aim of collecting data, of gathering data on school violence and on gender-based violence, is so that we can design more effective policies and programs to prevent and respond to violence at all levels with a whole school approach to ensure inclusive and equitable learning for all. Next slide, please. We're very, very grateful for the 18 people who worked with us in the expert working group and to the colleagues who facilitated that work and who wrote this brief. I won't list them all, you can see their names. Um, but this was a collective effort bringing many minds from different parts of the world together to reach these conclusions. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And please feel free to scan the QR code or click the link in the um, chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing that summary of the technical brief. It was really interesting seeing the existing databases that already are there, how we can leverage upon them, and also thinking about the gaps that currently exist and the recommendations needed to harmonize, as you mentioned, the data that, that we can collect. I'm now excited to now move on to the next segment of today, which is the panel discussion. And we've got three brilliant experts joining us today. So I would like to welcome Ms. Maya Cornelia Musa from Transform Education and founder of the Be With You Indonesia. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Burrows, the Technical Officer of Violence Prevention Team um, from the World Health Organization. And finally, Professor Ian Rivers, the Associate Principal and Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Strathclyde. So my first question today is to Miss Maya Musa. And as a fellow young person, I wanted to ask a question about youth participation. How can we make sure that data and evidence are representative and inclusive of youth led research and expertise? Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for the question. I would like to say good day, everyone. So my name is Maya Kanemusa, but you can call me Maya, and I'm the founder of I'm the founder and executive director of Bridge Indonesia. So Bridge Indonesia is an Indonesian young feminist movement to support gender equality, and of course in Indonesia. Besides that, Bridge is is also an active member of Transform Education, hosted by the United Nations Girls Education Initiative, which is a coalition of young feminist-led networks working to achieve gender equality in through education. So we work collectively on ending school-related gender-based violence, or SRGBV. And even there, like a number of young feminist organizations have come together in a movement that sends a collective, sends a collective care to counter globally similar but contextually different effects of SRGBV. And we're also working to influence policy revision in schools and local education sector planning, which are all driven by data and evidence, obviously. As a youth-led NGO, we have been on both sides of producing data and evidence uh, through being participant in consultative processes, but also in a very active ways in being able to both shape and support data collection, because it's very important besides to also support its analysis to produce concrete evidence. So the youth led research has paved way to shed light that RGBV are more times underreported than any other type of school related violence. And we also acknowledge that often there are so many barriers that can prevent active and meaningful inclusion of young people in technical projects. So yeah, but there are like uh, there are three key best practices that I would like to address, and it's very important, uh, especially to ensure that data and evidence are representative and inclusive of young activists and researchers. So the first one is that research processes should be for granted in intergenerational principles and co-production uh, to include young feminists to co-create research process. And this also can look like institu instituting and writing into proposals mechanism that allow for young people to be co designers or research question, but also school of research and methods of data. Uh, and also, but besides that, it's also very important to keep in mind that uh, not only that, but also analyze analyzes it. Uh, meanwhile, there are often time 
timelines time due to like due to like donor restrictions. And we believe that actually this is critical to ensuring for sharing and inclusive business ecosystem that is actually truly transformative and inclusive. So the second one it is actually the most important thing that to collaborate with youth led organization and ensure that they are actually compensated and named as a cultures. Because however, most of the time we, we've seen that uh, people in or even institution engage youth led movement without any compen compensation, which is not okay. So it's very important to keep in mind that it's the most important thing as well. And we also must move beyond consulta consultations and create spaces for young people to be co-authors or even uh, to be co-authors of a recent project or even uh, involved meaningfully. So not so not only participating, but involved meaningfully. And the last one is that build capacity strengthening programs into youth engagement strategies and to ensure that young people are able to access training and resources based and conduct quizzes because most of the time we are not able to do something because we don't get that access so supporting this access for young people is also very important so this allows us to for an action and increase capacity as young people uh, and it, it it will also both uh, sharpen and learn new skills that can help uh, young people to address issues like as achievement in their communities and schools and i would like a little bit examples for that so BWT Indonesia, uh, we have this uh, we have this supporting mechanism, but before that happened, uh, I'm, I'm also an influencer in Indonesia. Uh, I create a lot of that on TikTok, and there are like so many young people uh, contacting me on my TikTok, Instagram, telling telling me that they face uh, SRGBV or even gender based violence in public. And after that, we think it's very important for us to support them by giving them the facility the facility. Uh, to facilitate them and to bridge them into something that will create a safe space. So based on that, we create BWG in the university level. And after that, we want to create like a gender inclusion at the university and schools level. And after that, we try to give application to the schools and university together with the students uh, in school and also at the university. Uh, because there are like so many things that are going on but meanwhile, it's very important for young people to also acknowledge that it's it's a, it's the most important thing is that giving all the space for them, but also uh, this intergenerational collaboration uh, that we try to build together along the way together with the schools and university. And the last one, it's the TE Southeast Asia Regional Consultation. Uh, we basically call Sorry, this Maya. Um, sorry, we just want to spend some time for the other uh, panelists to also yeah, yeah, share their yeah. responses, but I'm looking forward to hear your elaboration on that with the second question as well. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so now we're going to be moving on to Dr. Stephanie Burrows. Um, now, earlier we were talking about, um, like Joanna mentioned, about all the different databases that exist. And Maya just mentioned as well about the importance of involving young people in that data collection as well. My question to you now is, to what extent do our existing global data sets help us understand the scale and phenomenon of violence in schools? Thanks very much and hello everybody and thank you very much for, for inviting me to be part of this discussion today. And we know that prevalence estimates from administrative data used by health or justice systems vastly underestimate the true magnitude of violence against children. Nationally representative survey data are therefore critical in providing a more realistic picture of the burden. Existing global data sets like the GSHS, HBSC and BACS that Joanna mentioned provide important data on violence in schools. Depending on the survey, they ask questions about physical, sexual, and emotional violence and or bullying. With prevalence, while prevalence data are incomplete, the data we do have suggests that violence in schools is enormous. With one in three students being bullied and all involved in physical fights, this is an issue that policymakers and school administrators should be focusing on. Knowing the size of the problem and whom it affects most is critical for prevention efforts and allocating resources. Most global surveys ask about victimization, but in some cases, for example, the VACs, there are also questions about perpetration. 
So for example, data from some uh, sub-Saharan African countries show that the prevalence of violence perpetration among males ranges between 30 and 52%, and among females between 15 and 28%. And these data also clearly show the cyclical nature of violence. Experiencing violence in childhood was the strongest predictor for perpetrating violence. In addition to asking about violence itself, global surveys also ask important questions about other aspects of young people's lives, such as risk and protective factors, as well as the impact of violence. So for example, we know from the GSHS that childhood exposure to physical and sexual violence is associated with many adverse health behaviors, such as multiple sexual partners, suicidal ideation, cigarettes, alcohol, and drug abuse. And this is critical information when trying to address those health behaviors. The number of countries covered by each uh, survey varies. For example, the VACs have been or are being carried out in 23 countries, while the GSHS has been conducted in 104 countries. And it's vital that more countries undertake to conduct these surveys, and importantly, to repeat them at regular intervals so that we can measure progress over time and assess the level of investment needed to meet national and global targets. Ideally, the global data sets will increasingly harmonize data collection methods and measures. And this includes using the same recall periods, age groups, violence classification, and survey questions so that data can be aggregated and comparisons can be made. And this would really help our understanding of the scale and dimensions of school violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, I completely agree the importance of seeing it over time and how we are progressing towards the targets. Professor Ian Rivers, I now wanted to ask you a question about, well, there are several challenges in collecting data about violence or bullying. And can you outline what are some of those challenges? Thank you for the question and hello, everybody. Um, I think there are five things that we need to consider when we're considering the measurement of violence or bullying. The first one, as um, Joanna mentioned earlier, is definition. Who defines what it is that we're looking at? Um, is it violence or bullying? Is it physical, verbal, relational or electronic? These things are really important and how we use those definitions is incredibly important because they do vary across surveys. So one of the questions we have to consider is whether or not definitions that we use limit the scope of the project. Also, we need to think about cyber aggression particularly as that is changing all of the time with different applications and platforms. So how do we capture the multitude of ways in which young people can be hurt, abused or tormented by others? In some research, no definitions are used, and it's left to the target of the aggression to determine whether or not they've been subject to violence or bullying. How does this skew the data? And how does it allow for cross-cultural or, uh, or cross-study comparisons? This is really challenging. The second issue are ultimately the measurement tools that we use. So how do we measure behaviors? Do we use dichotomous, as in yes, no responses? Do we use ordinal scales that are often related to frequency or duration? Do we use interval scales that are often relate to frequency or intensity? And also the time scale. Is it the last week, the last 30 days, the last 90 days, the last year or ever? The third issue is ultimately perspective. Whose perspective do we use as our measure? And um, that has also been reflected upon by Stephanie. Are we looking at the target of the aggression? Do we consider the perpetrator? What about the bystander? Or do we take a measure of all three? The fourth point is about the determination of intent. What was the intent of the perpetrator? Was it to harm another? Or do we base our measure on the reaction or outcome of the behavior? Or do we do a combination of both? And related to that, the five point is, what do we measure in terms of outcome? 
with respect to more subtle forms of relational aggression, what if there's no reaction or there is no response? What is our measure of impact and what instruments do we use? So, for example, do we consider mental health outcomes as an index? So these are some of the challenges that we face in measuring violence and bullying. So thank you. And I'll pass you back to um, our host. Thank you very much, Ian. Those were very important questions for consideration as we come up with ways that we can measure school related gender based violence. Over back to you now, Maya. Now, in the first question, you ended off talking about some different ways that youth NGOs can be involved um, in the data collection process, um, in addition to the consultations. So my question to you now is, from a youth perspective, what role do you see data playing in creating and implementing inclusive strategies to end SRGBV? Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's actually very important because I will give one of the examples that data can also help to identify to prevalence SRGBV, but also to identify the gaps. So for the example, which groups are missing and the type of responses and intervention that have not been implemented. So it can also serve as an like, accountability mechanism for schools and governments to determine areas for improvement and actions. And besides, data informs the majority of the current and upcoming SRGPV global and policy guidelines and the programs. But what kind of data do we actually require? That's one of the things that is very important to us. So we want to see the data and evidence being collected are inclusive and prioritize nuance in terms of everyone's lives, experience, context, identities, sexualities and vulnerabilities. We also need to realize the varying degrees of how violence is perpetuated because different background, different environment might have different perspectives as well and different conditions. So during the Asia Pacific SRGBV Symposium, which this was the one that I want to share before, uh, we uh, so basically we, we are at TE have had lights that as RGBV is a deeply personal experience for many of us, including me. So some of the uh, feminists at the forefront fighting for this uh, and are the same survivors of SRGBV. And we have to go above and beyond statistics. One report for incidents of SRGBV is enough to set an alarm and take an action. So in acts of systemic violence, data should not only be, uh, data is not only should be like uh, representative, but data and evidence role is to humanize this and catalyze action that are directly coming from grassroots voices. So we don't have to wait until hundred people, million people, but every data is valid, one voice is valid. And in my organization, Be With You, we started a reporting mechanism that I have shared before, uh, within the university and schools. And this mechanism provided two type of uh, intervention. The first one is face-to-face -face consultation, refer to counseling professionals and bridging survivors to get legal assistance for free. We have recorded many type of data, start from quantitative and qualitative in, in form of like research modules and even campaigns. And this has informed the way our intervention are designed. We saw that the demand for survivor center care, physician and further counseling services, et cetera. And because of this intervention as well uh, that we have started, we have supported universities and co-created with them programs that came from these demands. And it's very important. Uh, as such, we are calling for gender transformative approaches in presenting, collecting and analyzing data and evidence as well. But how we translate data, does not only inform the intervention, but it's actually life-changing for young people and survivors of violence. So the data carefully and efficiently go uh, through uh, effective met uh, methodologies uh, to ensure inclusivity, diversity, and leaving no learner behind. Because that's very important to just make sure that everyone is, in, everyone is heard and that no one is left behind. So that's it. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Maya.
Yes, so I really liked how you were highlighting the importance of, you know, making action straight away. We don't need to wait for, you know, like thousands of um, data responses. It's if there's enough to create action, we should be creating action. So back to you now, Dr. Stephanie. Um, so before uh, Ian was talking about, you know, some of the challenges and what we, what's really important is that we don't reinvent the wheel. We think about what is already existing and thinking about how we can improve it as well. So from your perspective, what can be done to integrate a gender analysis into major multi-country data sets and to bring the learning from violence against women and girls data into school violence prevention? Great, thanks so much for the, the question. So Violence Against Women and Girls has actually received a lot of global attention and several large surveys focus on this. And in 2021, WHO released the Violence Against Women Prevalence Estimates, which are based on a systematic and comprehensive review of all available data on uh, the prevalence of intimate partner violence and non-partner sexual violence. And these internationally comparable estimates provide a sense of the size of the burden at country, regional and global levels and have served to raise awareness of the issue among policymakers and other stakeholders. So there's a lot of learning to be done from that. Uh, also, efforts to systematically address violence between males have, has received far less global violence prevention attention. So there's a need to better understand masculinity and how it impacts on violence. Male and male violence accounts for 80 to 90% of all homicides and a large majority of all violence related injuries that receive emergency medical care. There's now an understanding that advancing gender equality also requires engaging men and boys, and moreover that individuals' experiences of security and justice are lived not only through their identified sex and gender, but through other intersecting identities, such as age, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, disability, and legal status. So it's therefore very important that data are disaggregated not only by sex, but also by these other intersecting forms of discrimination. And research shows that there is a causal story between uh, gender inequality and violence and abuse, with societies with fewer economic, social, and political differences between men and women experiencing lower rates of violence against women and girls. And to effectively address this violence, there's a need to understand and address the, uh, the attitudes and structures that underpin it. So some global data sets already do this, but it would also be important to include questions of, on perceptions of gender and violence, such as the acceptance of domestic violence or women's auto autonomy, uh, as these provide insight into the value of women and girls and gendered power differentials. And finally, as has been mentioned by others, strengthened coordination across the different sectors working on this issue is absolutely critical so that we can better harmonize data collection efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now over to you, Professor Ian Rivers. So we just talked about, you know, how we can um, learn from the violence against women and girls data, but gender-based violence is more than about girls and women. So how has your research on LGBTIQ learners informed your view of GBV? Thank you for the question. And I think my answer will, um, reflect both Maya and Stephanie's comments already. So I think it's really important that we remember that violence um, is not only gender based, but is also gendered. It differs across the sexes as well as within them. We see different patterns of behavior and different combinations of behavior dependent upon the sex of the perpetrator and the sex of the target. We also see ways in which prevalent beliefs and attitudes influence entitlements. And some people think that they are entitled to harass or otherwise denigrate one group whom against another, and that group they perceive to be somewhat different. Finally, we also see the value that some people place upon human life. And particularly, there is again a belief that some lives are more important than others. The second big issue for me is the reason a person is bullied or subject to violence can also be determined by the cultural and social attitudes surrounding a particular minority group 
And this is what I've learned from my work with LGBTQI um, learners. However, in looking at particularly LGBTQI learners, I've also learned that um, those beliefs and attitudes also determine particular things, such as the intensity of the aggression to which targets are subject, the likelihood of it being reported, and the likelihood that someone will intervene. And I think it's also important that we consider what support mechanisms exist and how they can support long-term well-being. Let's not forget that violence and bullying that we talk about as being school related, not only happens in the buildings, but it happens on public transport as young people are going to and from school. It happens outside the home. It happens in community spaces. And it does happen behind closed doors, but quite often it is out in the open. And the one thing I would reflect is the subtlety of some forms of aggression that are perpetrated against minorities. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from gay activist Aaron Frick, who wrote in his autobiography that one boy in his science class looked at him with such intensity that that intent to harm him was clear. And he described that look as, and I quote, an uninterrupted gaze that could melt steel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, as well as Maya and Stephanie for sharing your insights. We're now going to jump into looking at some country examples. So I would like to now first introduce Ms. Bamba Bura Adjaratur, Director of Strategy, Planning and Statistics, Ministry of Education of Cote d'Ivoire. Over to you. Merci, Madame. Merci de me passer la parole. Bonjour à tout le monde. Je suis, uh, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Miss Bamba. I work in statistics, the statistics direction. I am also a member of the national follow-up and assessment team for education and access to health and uh, in uh, schools. I am speaking on behalf of this entire team in order to introduce to you the experience in my country in Côte d'Ivoire. The idea is to integrate violence indicators in schools into the EMIS, the Education Management Information System. So I will be telling you about three different points. Firstly, I will be introducing the key factors for success coming from data collection relating to, uh, relating to school-related gender-based violence. Secondly, I will be telling you about the main indicators that were generated. And thirdly, the different challenges that we need to face. So for my first point, the key factors for success. We must be aware of the negative consequences of violences, whatever the violence might be, whether, the, whether it be sexual, physical, psychological. There is also the question of forced marriages, female genital mutilation so many different types of violence and that's why we made uh, different tables that take into account all of these all of these kinds of violence this was done since 2016 and 2017 we inc we included this in our yearly school census surveys gender violence is still not being talked about enough in our school census surveys. It is. It still has limitations. But of course, we did not stop there. We did not just stop at including this in our surveys. At the uh, school statistics direction, and alongside the direction in charge of mutuality and social work, we are working together in order to harmonize the data that was collected. 
the goal being, of course, to improve the quality of the data. In order to do so as well, we are providing regular training to data providers, such as heads of uh, school directors, for example. So now the data we manage to collect allow us to create main indicators. The first indicator we managed to create was the percentage of students that are victims of violence. These indicators are disaggregated depending on the kind of violence, on the gender of the victim, and also the age category they belong to. The second indicator we created, thanks to the data that we collected, is the following, the percentage of instances of violence that were reported. Because instances of violence happening is one thing, but instances of violence being reported to relevant authorities is a different thing. So when I'm saying re relevant authorities, I'm referring to prefects, subprefects, the police, social workers, etc. And our final indicator is the percentage of schools that implemented at least one mechanism to fight violence. So, as I was saying earlier, we have integrated these indicators into our data collection tools. But we have huge challenges left to face, and we have to realize this. The first challenge relates to data quality. We know that violence is a very sensitive issue, so it's even more difficult to get respondents to tell us the truth. Now, one possible solution to this issue is to check the reliability of the data while it's being collected in at least 10% of the schools that are being surveyed. And this is something that our partners can take care of. We are aware that there are shortcomings. We're aware that we are currently underestimating the situation. Now, the second challenge is to ensure that we make a distinction between gender-based violence and regular violence. And another challenge is that we have to be able to collect data on violence that is being perpetrated by students themselves. Because what we're doing is we're currently taking a look at violence being perpetrated by students within the school but also outside of the school and these studies uh, should give us data that we can use in order to objectively tackle the complex issue that is school violence i am now done with my presentation thank you very much for listening thank you very much examples. Over to you. Thank you so much, Maria. Great. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and huge thanks to you, Maria, for moderating and to Ungai and UNESCO colleagues for bringing us together today. Um, my name is Chrissy Hart, and I serve as Director of Policy and Advocacy with Together for Girls. So we are a global partnership between the US government, the State Department, and specifically the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, the US Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention, and USAID, um, as well as seven UN entities, including um, the WHO, UNICEF, UN Women, UNFPA, and others, and 23 national governments that have or will conduct a violence against children and youth surveys, um, including Cote d'Ivoire. So very excited to be with my colleague from the Ministry of, um, of Education in Cote d'Ivoire. 
Um, I'm going to briefly share work we've done um, using the VAX data to better understand um, school-related gender-based violence by conducting secondary analyses. And as Joanna mentioned, the VAX are one of the four um, data sets that we considered in the work of the expert group. So VAX are household surveys conducted among 13 to 17 and 18 to 24 year olds, um, adolescents and youth alike, capturing their experiences of violence within the last 12 months and up until the age of 18 for that 18 to 24 year old group. They are led by national governments um, with technical assistance from the US Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention and Together for Girls. And they comprise the largest global data set on violence against children, adolescents and youth specifically, representing about 12% of the world's children and youth overall and 20% in low income, low and middle income countries. So VAX capture experiences of physical, sexual, and emotional violence, um, the consequences of violence and crucial demographic data that help us to understand both risk and protective factors for violence. Um, and the data collection within the VAX is very intentionally sex disaggregated and collected through a gender lens, including questions that are tailored to girls' experiences and questions that capture norms and attitudes around gender and the acceptability of gender-based violence. You can see from this slide that VAX data demonstrates high levels of sexual violence in childhood um, and prior to the age of 18, specifically across countries and regions. And VAX help us to understand um, particularly the unique experiences of girls and their vulnerability to specific forms of gendered violence throughout childhood and adolescence. This slide demonstrates, for example, that while the risk of sexual violence increases through adolescence, many girls' first experience of sexual violence happens at age 13 or earlier, highlighting how critical it is to take a gendered lens and work to prevent and respond um, to violence in earlier childhood and, um, and uh, among child protection efforts writ large. VAX data also demonstrates the linkages between violence against children and girls particularly, and violence against women, as we've heard a bit in the webinar so far. We often see the girls' experiences of violence in childhood increase the risk of experiencing violence in adulthood. And similarly for boys, experiences of violence in childhood increase the risk of perpetration as well as experiencing violence in adulthood. So we wanted to leverage VAX data to understand specifically how experiences of violence in childhood and adolescence interface with school settings and educational attainment. We conducted analyses of 13 countries VAX data sets to produce limited estimates of SRGBV and to understand differences in experience, experiences of violence among girls and boys. We've used these data to produce policy briefs and for work directly with governments seeking to strengthen education sector engagement in violence prevention and response. While the VAX is not an education specific or school based survey, it gives us data on the location of violence, including schools and school related perpetrators, including teachers and classmates. So our research questions included understanding overall national rates of, G of SRGBV among boys and girls, gender differences in the prevalence and forms of violence girls and boys experience, the consequences of violence, including school absenteeism, and rates of disclosure, service seeking and service receiving for survivors. Additionally, we included indicators that measure attitudes around gender equality, the acceptability of gender-based violence, and the acceptability of corporal punishment specifically. And so again, limitations include that VAX is not a school-based or school-specific sur survey. Our estimates of SRGBV are based on a collection of indicators that may not be representative of all experiences of SRGBV, and VAX don't identify the motivation for violence specifically, but rather allow us to correlate between attitudes around gender equality and the acceptability of GBV um, and violence. So in each country we analyzed, there were distinctly gendered differences in the experiences of violence in and around schools. And you can see from this slide that rates of SRGBV are consistently high across countries. We found generally that girls are at a higher risk for sexual violence in schools as has been discussed, while boys experience more physical violence that is peer perpetrated um, by other classmates and corporal punishment at the hands of teachers. And so our findings are very much aligned with the SRGBV technical brief. Um, we, our findings reveal that violence in and around schools is highly gendered and that there are important variations in gender dynamics um, of SRGBV across Sorry, country Chrissy. contexts. Just in the no interest worries. of time, I'm wondering if you could totally. um, wrap up within the next few uh, minutes. Absolutely, yeah. And so additional findings include that effective prevention requires understanding the ways that gender 
roles, attitudes, and norms impact the prevalence um, and nature of violence. And this necessitates, as we've been discussing, the use of a gendered lens to collect, interpret, and employ sex disaggregated quantitative and, where possible, qualitative data. Um, yeah, and just to wrap up, I want to um, just read this quote from Paulo Pinero, who contributed to the UN Secretary General's study on violence against children. I think he sums up what we're getting at really neatly. Um, and he says that the study on violence against children recognizes that virtually all forms of violence are linked to entrenched gender roles and inequalities, and that the violation of the rights of children is closely linked to the status of women. And this just affirms the imperative that our data analyses show that work to prevent violence against children um, and child well-being in general must be developed and implemented with a gendered lens. Thank you so much. Back to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for sharing um, all these multi-country examples. I would like to now introduce Antara Ganguly from Angai to now um, share the closing remarks for today. Hello, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you all today, although we are discussing something that is hard to talk about. Um, I have learned so much from all of the information that was shared and the very rich discussion that's been taking place on, on chat. The message of the technical brief we're launching today is very clear. No matter how much effort we make to end school-related gender-based violence, if we are not measuring prevalence or qualifying and quantifying its impact, we will continue to speak and act within a vacuum. Why? Let me frame it in three dimensions. First, the backlash against gender equality is unending and alarming. UNDP's recent Gender Social Norms Index that hit the headline says it all. Globally, close to nine out of 10 men and women, so women as well, hold fundamental biases against women with no improvement in the past decade. 25% of people, and in some countries where this has been measured by children, it is a similar statistic, 25% of people believe it is justified for a man to beat his wife. What this tells us is that violence is universal because it is, because it is invisible, and it is invisible because it's normal. We think it's normal for a boy and another boy to start beating each other up as an expression of friendship. We think it's normal for a man to beat his wife. We think it's normal, and this is related, for a girl to do certain chores at home while the son is either being sent for additional tuitions or is watching TV at leisure. It tells us that there we have a very, very long, the data that we have tells us that we have failed. It also tells us that we have a very long way to go with the antidote for gender-based violence and all forms of violence, and that is gender transformative education. We need education that prevents the harmful norms that children are born into and, help, and helps children to ask the questions that will lead them to see that gender is actually a social construct that oppresses women and girls and men and boys as well. Second, without collecting gender disaggregated data on violence in schools, we move away from human rights approaches, and this leads, leaves huge gaps in elevating SRGBV. An example of this would be conversation around what is a smart buy, uh, or focusing exclusively on learning outcomes without recognizing that children need to feel safe, children need to, be, need to feel nurtured before they can learn. Finally, we need to revisit and innovate on how we collect SRGBV data. And I think we heard some really fantastic examples on that today. Collecting data on violence can be traumatizing and also biased. And so we need a gendered lens to collect, interpret and employ data. We need to amplify the numbers. We need to use feminist methodologies like action research. We need to center children and young people as we heard from uh, Indonesia and as we know works in India and the Philippines as well. 
and we need to take a whole of school approach because violence is not just about that one child or about that one perpetrator who can also be a child. It is about that environment that leads those two individuals to think that this is an option, that this is a solution. So let us continue to work together to end this global and long-standing pandemic, the civilizational pandemic. Data is important to these efforts to ensure that our schools are truly just a place to learn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antara, for sharing those powerful and motivating words. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. I would like to now close today's webinar.